All right, so it looks like we are good to go again. And our next, uh, I see uh, so far, we have Phil Sherrod with us. And let me give you a little bit of an introduction. Uh, just uh, Phil is W4PHS, is a career software developer and a member of the WinLink development team. Phil holds an extra class ham license and a commercial GROL license. Phil has a degree in physics. He's been developing a wide variety of software for more than 40 years. His work on the WinLink team involves developing and supporting the WinLink <laughs> Express client program and the programs used by RMS, RMS TriMode, RMS Relay, RMS Packet. For additional information about Phil, see his QRZ page at W4PHS. And uh, I'd like to welcome Phil again. I'm, a, I, I'm sorry that you had to do this twice. Hey, Scott and everybody else. I'm happy to be here. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. And uh, hopefully we can make it through this time with audio. I'm going to talk about the WinLink radio email system. And when we were discussing this before the talk, Scott said that to expect most of the people on the conference to be experienced WinLink users. So I've shifted my presentation from my usual introduction to WinLink, what is WinLink, into a talk which is going to focus more on some features which are a little more esoteric and that a lot of WinLink users don't even know exist. So if you're a brand new WinLink user, I've got just a very brief introduction, but then I'm going to shift into uh, some, some more advanced features uh, that I think might be interesting to people who have more experience with WinLink. Uh, as to get started here, let's talk about just a, a very brief introduction. Of course, what WinLink is, is an email radio system. It's worldwide. As far as I know that with a HF radio and a decent antenna, there's no spot on the face of the earth that you can't send and receive email with WinLink. It's a very mature, well-tested system, very reliable. Uh, we've been up for 15 years, and I'll put our reliability up against any other system, cell phone, Amazon Web Services, you name it. We're, we've been very solid. We're in use uh, at all levels of MCOM, all the way from OXCOM, all the way up to the federal government, everything in between. Uh, the Shares Federal Agency uh, is using Winlink extensively. They operate on, on NTIA non-HAM frequencies, and they have set up about 90 shares RMSs that operate in their own private frequencies. Also used by the National Guard, we have about 14 drop kits in Tennessee that can be deployed, and also NGOs like Red Cross, Salvation Army, and so forth use it. Over the last 15 years, we have seen a, a trend in our user base away from maritime to more towards emergency communication, MCOM. We still have a fair number of sailors uh, that are using WinLink, but uh, the number of blue water sailors has declined over the, la over the years and the uh, number of MCOM people has increased. So that's the general direction. Hey, Phil. <clears throat> the, Phil? Yes. So uh, you had a slide deck that you would we were going to project, right? Because we're not seeing the slide deck. Oh, really? Oh, hold photo. on. Oh, shoot. Well, let me see here. Hold on. Let's see what I need to do here. Uh, I thought I said share my screen. Let's see here. Is it on a different screen? Hold on. Share screen. Just a second here. Maybe I forgot to select the right one. How's that? Uh, there. There it is. Okay. Sorry. All righty. Let's try again then. All right. Okay. So look okay? That looks fantastic. Okay. Well, this is a slide I just went over, so I won't cover that again. I think we've... Um, the, the last line I will mention, uh, the development is driven by user input and experiences. We, a lot of the times when people use this in actual incidents, we get feedback uh, from them after action reports. And they'll either say it worked great or they found something awkward or they were loved to have something. And we go to work and add it in. Uh, same thing with exercises. We're very driven by uh, the reports we get from uh, incident exercises. So if anyone listening and actually uses it during exercises or incidents, we'd love to hear afterwards how it worked and whether you have some ideas for things which would make it better. The, I think you could say the measure of any communication system is how interoperable it is and how it makes it possible for different people to, to communicate. I mean, that's the goal of it is to communicate between multiple people. 
And Windlake is extremely interoperable. It connects uh, people in the, from the Oxcom level all the way up to Shares and Mars and other groups. Uh, we support multiple protocols, Pactor, Winmore, Bar, and RDOP. And I caught the last half of the Arda or the Bar session before me, and I, I completely concur that Bar is a wonderful protocol. As a lot of Windlake users are using it, we're continuing to add support for it. Of course, VHF, UHF, Packet, and Bar FM. We also support SMT POP and IMAP uh, interfaces to programs like Outlook and other mail clients. And I'll talk about that more later. And we uh, work well over mesh networks and we have post office servers for mesh. And I'll talk about that later. Also work over Iridium Go satellite connections. And of course we provide a radio bridge uh, from client stations in the field to internet email which allows connectivity with almost everyone in the world. So if you think about a Winlink user, which can talk to National Guard or shares or other Oxcom groups, but also can send email to anybody in the world, uh, it's about as interoperable as you can get. It's pretty much a worldwide interoperable system with anybody if you, that has email. This is a little reminder of why Oxcom and HF radio is important. Uh, this was the Kentucky ice storm some years ago, and you notice the cell tower, they're completely covered by ice there. All of their cell service, all of their public service radios were knocked out by this ice storm. A couple of people, the MCOM people from Tennessee went up to Kentucky to figure out what was going on, and they sent this picture, picture back by Winlink uh, to the um, Tennessee Emergency Management Agent to show what the conditions were like. This is a... a a, a, a picture or an image of the connective paths in during one 24 hour period back in October uh, between different stations. And you can see the sort of the scope of Windlink across this area. There are roughly 2,500 active channels. It says RMS stations, really channels around the world, about 25,000 active users over a 90 day period. and. We, we, trans, we pass roughly 50,000 messages every 30 days. So it's a pretty active system. This is a map of the current HAM, uh, HF Pactor stations in, in, in well, North America and also uh, Western Europe. Pretty well cover the area. And of course, with, H, with the footprint, the reach of HF, you don't have to be right next door to one to make connections. I go from Tennessee to California and Canada and Mexico pretty regularly. Uh, on occasion, I've made it across the Atlantic and connected directly into stations in Europe. Uh, this is a map of the shares packed or RMS stations. Again, these, this is operating on non-ham frequencies. And notice we go from Hawaii to Alaska down to Puerto Rico and pretty well cover the country with share stations. I want to talk about some features that uh, users may or may not know about and uh, talk just a little bit about some things you may want to explore if you're a Winlink user and have just been sending and receiving messages and haven't dug, in, dug into some of the more advanced features that are available in the system. One of the features that we built in, again, this was based on experience from exercise and incidents was a, a internal message receipts a system, which is basically a read receipt if you're from the normal email. And when a message comes in, uh, you can click a button on the, the, the Winlink Express toolbar to say, I want to send an acknowledgement and a screen pops up like this. That's already been populated with information about the message that was received and when it was actually read and uh, let you know, that lets the sender know that uh, your message was actually read. You can also, when you send a message, request a, an acknowledgement from the uh, person who's reading, and, and this screen pops up automatically when the message is read. There are options internally in the preferences screen where you can have it send back an acknowledgement automatically, uh, invisibly, it silently generates an acknowledgement, accuse it to go out when a person requests an acknowledgement. And there's, an, uh, there's another option which goes the other way, which says, look, I'm just not interested in sending acknowledgements at all, so don't bug me about it. So it, even if they request one, you're not going to be bugged. And that also came from requests from field experience. Uh, my, my experience, I've never been in any major you know, deployments, but I have been, been involved in many in exercises. And 
what, what I have discovered is that if you really want to practice or, or operate in MCOM situations, it, you really need to have acknowledgments to know the message you receive. Otherwise, you may be sending a lot of messages and uh, they may not be getting to anyone. So an acknowledgement is basically a Roger. I got your message. It doesn't mean that they're going to act on it, but it means at least they got it. Winlink Express has a built-in picture editor. And if you attach a, a picture to a message, uh, you can then, and it's too big, or you want to just uh, edit it for other reasons, you can open the picture editor. And within the editor, you can either crop the picture or you just simply resize it without changing the contents. Uh, in this example, I have a rather large picture of the Statue of Liberty in Ellis Island. What I've done is selected only uh, Lady Liberty. And then if I click the crop button, it'll uh, crop it down to just her. And then uh, that'll greatly reduce the size of the picture. Or if I wanted to send the whole thing, I could have just done a resize and it would let me select how big a picture I want to use for sending. And that's built in so you don't have to use an ex any external program. Winley catalog requests. This is an interesting feature that a lot of people don't know about. Uh, there's a catalog feature and there are literally hundreds of things that you can request that are weather products, satellite images, all sorts of information that are available through the, a catalog request. And the way it works is that you select the category of request in the left column. Over here, I've selected satellite pictures and then when you select a category, the main column in the middle is populated with all the different items of that category. And then you select an item from that list and put it in the request list. And that generates a specially formatted message uh, ready to be sent into the Winlink system. Now, that message is just an ordinary message, although the contents are special. But it's as far as transmission is concerned, it's an ordinary mission message. So you can send it via BHF, UHF, Telnet, or HF into the Winlink system. And then once you've sent a request in, it's processed by the system and a reply message with an attachment, uh, having an attachment, is queued to go back to you. Then in a few minutes, you can connect and you receive the uh, re message in reply to your request. And it'll be whatever you requested. Here's an example. I sent a request in for satellite image of, of North America and uh, received this back uh, showing the uh, cloud cover over the country. There are, as I said, there are hundreds of different things you can request. If you're in the field and you want to get a weather forecast, satellite image, or anything, wave conditions out in the ocean, you can do all of that uh, through catalog requests. Message templates and forms. I think most people probably know about this. Uh, built into Winlink Express, we have many different uh, forms. We have uh, a, a large assortment of ICS forms, but we also have forms that have been requested by various groups, sometimes a particular hospital group or uh, maybe a West Coast uh, uh, Red Cross group will request some sort of special form that meets their needs. And uh, we have uh, several members of the Winlink development team that focus on forms and they take these requests and are quite responsive. Usually when a, a request comes in for a form within a, oh, just a week or so, they'll have a form generated for them and incorporated into the standard package of forms. And this is all built in. I think we have about 90 forms right now and, and the number is growing steadily. So if you're part of a group that needs a particular form to meet your requirements and it's not part of our package, if you can send us a copy of the form, scan it, and send it to us, we'll try to accommodate you and get some uh, some custom forms for you. If you. Just look down this list. You'll see that you'll see near the bottom. You see Texas state forms, Virginia, Washington state forms, and some sort of medical forms. So, Ohio, we've got a lot of different forms that have been requested over the years, and we've we've made for them. Here's an example of a sort of a standard 213. It looks just like a regular tooth paper tooth uh, 213 is ready to be transmitted and receiving in when they open the message we'll see uh, this form on their screen and they can of course print it out and then hand it in and it looks just like a paper form was was generated although a nice with nice neat printing instead of rough handwriting 
Also built in is a, a 309 message log generator. A, a 309 is a standard message log. It has a summary of all the messages sent or received by an operator during a period. Uh, you fill in uh, the information on the left, like the task ID, task name, and operational period, and station ID. And then you, you select whether you want messages that are in the inbox, read, outbox, and so forth, and also give it a date time range because you may only want to get the message messages for your shift. And then it generates uh, the output that's shown in the right here, and it's generated as a PDF form. You can take that PDF file and attach it to the message, a message and send it to the um, incident message manager, or you could print it out and hand it in. And we're, we're instead of having a very <laughs> rough and hard to read handwritten 309 form, and I've seen some that are really unreadable, uh, you can have a, a very neat one which has every single message, date and time, and uh, the subject of the message shown there. And it's a pretty impressive thing. And if you, if this is the format of that is exactly matches the standard 309. Now I'm going to shift into talking about the operating modes, and I'm going to focus on uh, the radio only mode. But before we get to that one, we need to have a sort of little foundation here. There are really four different modes that we support. There's conventional mode, which is what most people use, and that's where you connect from your client station to an RMS, and the RMS then connects up to the CMS, and your message is stored in the CMS, and others connect to a CMS and download it. Then there's radio only mode, which we also call hybrid mode because the RMSs can switch automatically between radio only and conventional. And it operates entirely without the internet and could function uh, indefinitely if the internet itself was down. We have peer to peer mode where two client stations make direct radio connection. And that works with all the different uh, radio modes. It could be a VHF, UHF, or it could be HF. And finally, we have mesh networks, which are either peer to peer connection between Wimlick Express over mesh or going through a post office server, which is hosted by Armis Relay. And I'm going to talk about that some because a lot of people aren't aware of that. This is a diagram of the conventional mode. <clears throat> uh, a, an ordinary user would be down at the bottom, the client station, and they've got a computer, a radio, an antenna. And they're making one of the uh, making a radio connection of one of these kinds. It could be packed or Winmore, you know, VAR, any of our modes, or VHF, UHF packet, into a radio message server or remote message server RMS. So the bottom link from the client up to the RMS is radio, or you could go telnet if you have an internet connection. But the connection from the RMS up to one of our CMSs is through the internet. We have two currently have two CMSs, both of which are hosted by Amazon. They're on separate uh, systems within Amazon. One is on the East Coast, one is on the West Coast. They are 100% redundant. <clears throat> when a message goes into one of our CMSs, it automatically synchronizes with the other CMS, uh, really in a matter of seconds, but certainly within a minute, both of the CMSs would have a copy of the message. The CMSs are uh, completely capable of handling all of the message traffic with only one of them. We can take a CMS down to reboot it, to install new software, to test it, and then bring it back online. When a CMS has been offline and comes back online, the other one recognizes that it's rejoined the, the cluster and it automatically populates it so it catches up again very quickly. So uh, with two of them and one being able to handle everything, the system has extraordinary uptime. Now, what if the internet is down? <clears throat> this is an, honestly a fairly unlikely scenario where we're talking about the entire internet being down and not just in an area. And uh, you know, I, I would say if the worldwide internet goes down, it probably would be a good idea to get your guns and food and head to a cave because the end of the world probably is coming. But WinLink will continue. Everything else may be gone, but WinLink will continue. 
because we offer a radio only operating mode that transfers messages without using the internet at all, nowhere, completely independent of the internet. It is not for normal circumstances, but it is there if the need arises. And you know, one thing I want to point out and make a, a really strong point about is that if you're deployed to an area that doesn't have internet, let's say hurricanes rip through Florida and all the internet's out in Florida, but the rest of the country's okay. When you deploy to Florida, you do not need to use radio only mode. All you need to do is use conventional mode and make an HF connection from your location in Florida to some RMS in Tennessee or North Carolina or Texas or wherever that does have internet and then use conventional mode. The only time radio only mode is really needed is if case one, the entire internet is down or case two, you're operating with an agency that requires radio only such as shares. But for all other operations, normal operations deployed to a no internet zone, use conventional windmill. Here's a diagram of how the radio only mode operates. You know, once again, at the bottom level, we have the client stations, computer, radio, and antenna. And they're using uh, some mode, some radio mode. It could be PAC, it could be HF to connect into an RMS. Now, where the RMS in the conventional system makes an internet connection up to a CMS, since there's no internet, the RMS stores the message that's being sent by the client. Once that connection is finished and they disconnect, then that RMS uses either PACTOR or very recently added BARA to make a radio only connection to another RMS. And it relays the message from RMS to RMS to reach the final destination RMS. So the link from the bottom layer from the client to an RMS could be any supported mode, any supported radio mode, including uh, VAR HF or packet to get into that RMS. But the forwarding mode used from RMS to RMS is only packed or, or VARA. And VARA was added within, well, within the last month. In the case of this forwarding, we require the stations on the RMS to use the registered version of VARA because the unregistered version is just too slow. So you have to have uh, the paid for the registered version of our on the RMS for forwarding. You do not have to have the, the paid version on the client stations that connect to the RMS. Since this is all done by radio forwarding and we don't have a central station, i.e. a CMS where all messages are stored, you have to select which RMSs you want to have your messages stored on for you to pick up. We call those the, your message pickup stations or MPS. These are radio only, these are RMSs that you have selected to be your designated RMSs where you will connect to receive the messages that were sent radio only. You get to choose which RMS they are. Uh, the, the smart thing would be to choose ones which you can reliably reach but which are not next door to each other because if the internet's out or you know some RMS gets knocked out for power reasons or whatever, you would like the other one to remain up. So generally you want to pick ones which you're pretty sure you can get to, but which are not uh, right next door to each other. You select your MPSs uh, in the Winlink Express program. Uh, there is a, a field in here for hybrid network parameters. In the upper section, uh, we allow people to select one, two, or three MPSs, but uh, we strongly encourage ordinary users to select only two because the more MPSs you select, the more copies of the message have to be sent around through the network radio only, and that adds more overhead to the system. So uh, we recommend three MPSs only for critical people like uh, shares headquarters or, or major uh, Red Cross headquarters, places like that, and for ordinary users to use only two MPSs. Uh, it's very easy to select them. That's a drop down list. You open the drop down list and simply select the ones you want to have, select two of them, and then register them, and then you're ready to go. It takes, after you register your MPSs, it takes 24 hours 
for all of the RMSs to uh, download that information and store it in their local databases. So when the internet goes down, they know what your MPSs are and they don't have to connect to a CMS to find out. So register your MPSs beforehand. Uh, don't expect them to be uh, operational and recognized for 24 hours. And But then after that, I recommend doing a test to verify that they're working properly. Also on the bottom of this field, we have a, on the screen, we have a field where you can specify an email address where you will be sent notifications of pending RMS or messages, radio only messages on the RMSs you've selected as your MPSs. And this email address could be a conventional uh, internet email address. It could be a WinLink call sign where you get a WinLink message. And uh, anytime the message, a radio only message shows up there, if it's been sitting more than the number of hours you specify, then that RMS will send you a message saying you've got pending radio only messages. You need to make a radio only message to this, a connection to this MPS to pick them up. Let's talk a little bit about radio only message routing, how it actually gets a message from the original RMS where a sender sent it in to the destination MPS where you're going to pick it up. Of course, the, the, the sender who sends a message to you does not have to know which RMSs you selected your MPS. They can send into any hybrid RMS and the RMS calculates the best route and then forwards a message, possibly through other RMSs, one or more if necessary, to reach the MPS station where they're stored. So HF, the, H, the, the radio only network in Winlink really, it is a mesh network in the true sense of a mesh network. Just in, however, the conventional use of the term mesh network usually refers to mesh over hi-fi microwave links, but this is a mesh operating over HF links, either PACT or VAR. The messages are automatically routed and forwarded from the original RMS where they're uh, sent into the system to the destination RMSs, which are the MPSs. It uses a a, a programming technique called dynamic programming to compute the globally optimum, optimum route. This is the same basic algorithm that's used by GPS to compute the best route from point A to B on a map, you know, which roads to take to get you there. It just happens to be a whole lot more complicated when you're dealing with HF than when you're dealing with roads, because you have all sorts of factors that come into play like propagation, time of day and so forth. As a message is moving from the original RMS through the network of RMSs towards the ultimate MPS, each RMS that it lands in on uh, along that route uh, recomputes the optimum path from it to the destination because unexpected things may have happened, propagation may have shifted, whatever. So whenever it gets a message in, it says, okay, well, let's see, it wants to go from me to this particular RMS message. Let me recompute it and see what the best path is from me to there right now. So it's all recomputed on the fly for each RMS. There are a lot of factors that go into computing the optimum route. I'll mention some of them, but there are others. One, of course, is the propagation between the RMSs for each potential frequency. A lot of times RMSs scan five different frequencies. Some of them are good during the daytime, some of them are good during the nighttime. Uh, the, the location, the relative location of the RMSs may make some frequencies good and some others uh, out of, you know, beyond the MP, uh, maximum usable frequency. So it's got to compute all of that to figure out which frequency uh, and which potential RMS it could reach. Obviously, it shifts by the time of day. Uh, the modes available, not every RMS supports the same mode. Some of them may support Pactor 2, 3, or in the case of shares, Pactor 4. They may support VARA, and uh, they're, they are different speeds. So it considers the likely speed based on the mode and also the size of the message. So it's how long is it going to take based on the speed I can get with that mode. It has to consider the sending and receive mode matching. You know, one station may be a Pactor only station, the other station may be VAR, so can't go that way. It has to choose a different route. 
In the case of the U.S., it has to consider regulatory restrictions on frequencies. You know, we may, we'd love to go on some frequencies that may be up to Canada, but maybe the Canada is operating on a frequency that's not legal in the United States, so we can't do that. So all that's got to play into considerations. Uh, sometimes message RMSs are excluded for various reasons. Sometimes maybe the sysop just knows that for various reasons he can't get this RMS. And he says, well, you know, I'm going to exclude that one from my list of potential RMSs. Whenever a connection failure occurs, the RMS you're trying to connect to is marked as being temporary unavailable. I mean, the connection failure could be because the RMS is down. It could be because they're busy or it could be because what we think is reasonable propagation is actually turned out not to be. So if we try to call a station and it fails, we wait a while, try to call again. After a while, we just say, hey, you know what? Hold off on that station for a period of time. When that happens, then it's going to start looking for an alternate route uh, around the RMS being held. Another consideration is the RMS, that the message has already gone through. We don't want to get a, go back into a loop. So if you started out in one RMS and went through a couple of other RMSs and you got into one now and it's looking around your side to Beth path, well, we want to exclude any RMS that's already gone through because if we send it back to them, we're back in the loop. So that's a consideration. There are manual propagation overrides that SysOp can use and also automatic busy detection and blocking. You know, we're when it is about to transmit it, checks the um, listen monitors and listens to see whether we detect a signal on that frequency. And if we do, uh, then we simply don't try it. We may choose a different frequency or ultimately we may have to change, choose a different RMS. So all of these factors and some others I didn't mention go into the route calculation. It's, it's a very complex piece of code. Uh, it was interesting to debug it, put it that way. Uh, it works well, it is not perfect. Propagation calculations are not perfect. Uh, retries and making decisions about whether a station is temporarily down or permanently down, or that's not a perfect process. Uh, busy detection is not perfect. So it does the best it can. It usually gets the job done, but it's certainly not as reliable or certainly not as fast as using conventional wind leak. How do you send a radio only message? Well, it's very easy. It's just like sending conventional messages. You just have to tell Winlink Express that you're sending a radio only message. There are two steps to sending a radio only message. First is in the co message composition process, and then actually in establishing the session. When you're composing a message up near the top of the message composition screen, there's a drop down, and I've highlighted here that I opened it and I selected the middle option, which is radio only message. Uh, the top option was a conventional wind lake message. The bottom option is a peer to peer message. So when you compose the message and select uh, which mode it's going to go through and then uh, post it to the outbox, uh, wind lake express knows that this message is has to be sent radio only or peer to peer or conventional. And if you make a different type of connection, it will not send that message using that connection. So if I queue up a radio only message and then make a conventional connection to an RMS, Winlink Express will not send the messages that are queued up for radio only. It'll hold them and say, nope, not going to send that. Then later, when you make a radio only connection to an RMS, then any radio only messages that are queued up to go will be sent at that time. A notice in the background of this, I've also shown the uh, the session selection choices, and I have selected a Pactor radio only session to be open once I'm ready to actually do the sending. So that's the second step is to select a radio only session, and we we support radio only with with, with all the different HF modes going into an RMS. Once you, by the way, why I've talked about setting up your MPS is once you do that, I really recommend testing it and you can send a message or you can have a friend exchange a radio only message with a friend to make sure both of you have your MPS set up and know how to send and, and receive radio only messages. Another way to test radio only is using what's called a ping message. Anyone can send a radio only ping message to test the connection to an RMS. 
A ping message is a special message. Uh, the subject of the message is forward slant P-I-N-G, forward slant. So ping is a subject enclosed in slants. The to address that you're sending the message to is not the call sign of a user, but rather is the call sign of an RMS that you're pinging. So the message is then sent into the system as a radio only message. It is forward, forwarded the normal radio only way, RMS to RMS until it finally reaches the, the RMS whose call sign is in the to, to field. And when RMS relay running on that machine receives the ping in message, it's, it generates an automatic reply saying, yep, your ping got to me at this uh, date and time. Here's the path it went through to get to me, and I'm sending back a reply with some information about myself. Here's an example of a reply to a ping message. You can see right in the middle of it, it says ping message path, and this was the path that this message took to get from the originating station. I sent it in to N5TW, and you can see the date and time it was received by N5TW. N5TW forwarded it to Kilo 6 uh, Sierra Delta Romeo, and that's the time it received it. And KS, K6 SDR forwarded it on to VE7 RBH. You can see the time it received it. So or I was picking or VE7 RBH, so it finally got there. And you can see the, the, the time it took to go through each RMS. Is, and then finally, VE7 RBH generated the reply coming back and uh, give it information about self. And if you look at the top there, you can see the path, return path, how it got back to N5TW. So I know how it got there, how it got back, what path it took, and the time through each link. And I confirmed that I was successfully able to, to ping VE7RBH. So it's a nice tool. Don't overuse it because this does you know, send messages along through the network, but uh, it does work. In the early days of testing, uh, when we, when I was first trying to <laughs> make sure that radio only really worked, I was having fun uh, pinging uh, remote stations just to see as an experiment whether I could get a message uh, long distances. And in one case, I sent a, a ping message from my home here in Nashville uh, to I pinged a, a station in China. We use, I don't think we have any RMSs in China now, but we used to have a station in actually in Eastern China. And that ping message, I eventually, it, it did make it all the way through and it, it made it up, went up to Canada. It took a while to get across the Atlantic, but uh, landed, I think in Scandinavia, worked its way through Europe and then up into Russia, got forwarded across Russia and finally made it into to China. So uh, radio only forwarding does work. It took, a, I think, more than a day <laughs> to, to be forwarded to China, but it, it, it did get there. I've also uh, ping stations in Africa and all other places. Okay, another thing that you can use to uh, examine routes, radio-only routes. Uh, this is built in RMS Relay, so it'd be used by a sysop, not by a client station. So there's a, a route simulator built in. And in RMS Relay, you can click View and then the simulated route option, and give it a from RMS call sign and a to RMS call sign, a compute, click Compute Route, and what it does is, is do the same calculation it would use to compute the route for a message trying to reach that destination RMS. And it shows you what it, the path it ex anticipates would be used and the time that it anticipates it would take to get there. So here from uh, N5TW, it expects it to go to KX4Z and then from KX4Z to be one yz and shows the frequencies and the path quality and what mode it'd be using and the total time it expects to reach there would be about 20 minutes. That's built in RMS Relay for your sysop. Now shifting gears here a little bit, you know, most people of course use Winlink Express to send and receive messages, but if you're operating in an EMA environment and particularly if you're trying to service a, an EMA uh, uh, facility, you may want to consider using ordinary email programs like Outlook or other email programs for the people there to send and receive messages. Uh, 
And to do that, you install RMS Relay at that site and configure it so that the SMTP, POP, and IMAP servers built into RMS Relay are operational. These are the standard email protocols used by programs, uh, programs like Outlook. SMTP being for sending messages, POP, the original old method for receiving incoming messages, and IMAP being the new uh, modern method for receiving messages, but they're the standard protocols. Each individual at the site uses a tactical address to identify themselves. So if you have multiple people at the EMA sending and receiving messages this way, they each one's assigned a tactical address. The actual radio control and HF forwarding and, and operation is done by RMS Relay, so the person who's uh, using Outlook to send and receive mail has to know nothing about Winlink system or how to tune a radio or turn a radio on or off. They just send and receive mail using Outlook like they normally do. It just happens to be going in and out uh, using uh, HF radio. This is a great mode for allowing people who are not radio people to continue sending and receiving messages if their internet goes out. Uh, we have this set up at uh, EMA in my county, and we have some critical people. I don't know if the mayor is currently on it, but we have uh, other top administrators that are using it. And uh, in the past, the mayor has been configured to use it. And uh, the beautiful thing is that there, it's, the, it's the normal Outlook program that they know how to use. It's right in their desktop. They just simply switch accounts in Outlook and then boom, they're sending, receiving messages. Then just like normal, they're just being relay out by HF radio instead of over the internet. Uh, just briefly here, I'm gonna talk about how to configure RMS Relay forward. It's very simple. There's a screen, uh, setting screen RMS Relay that you can open up, looks like this. Uh, in the upper part, you click check that box to enable SMTP, IMAP and the POP mail servers and they start running as background tasks within RMS Relay, you don't, that's it. You don't have to install any other software. They're all built into RMS Relay. Uh, then you specify the IP address that you want it to uh, listen to for connections from Outlook and specify the ports. You could use the standard SMT POP and IMAP ports, or you could configure different ones if you want to uh, avoid any conflict with another server. And optionally in the bottom there, if you want to, you can specify restrictions on who can connect. You can specify specific uh, users. You can say only win authorized WinLink users and so forth, or you can let it be open for anybody on the LAN uh, within that facility who wants to connect to be able to use it. So it's very simple. This is all built in RMS Relay. Uh, no other software to buy, no other software to install, just in, turn it on and it's ready to go and then configure the outlooks and it's all set up for, for use. Within RMS Relay, we talked about radio only forwarding where messages are sent and forwarded through the system to MPSs for radio only users to pick up. But another use for, for non-internet situations is forwarding a message out to another RMS to reach the internet, to reach a CMS to get the message out. And that also is available within RMS Relay. You can figure it on this screen that's built into RMS Relay and you can uh, have set various parameters. You can set it to poll uh, periodically by HF to pull in messages. Uh, it automatically sends them out when they get queued to go. You can allow it to use any R other RMS uh, based on propagation, or you can specify a certain set of RMSs you want to restrict it to for forwarding to. Another cool feature of this is that you can set it so that it will use telnet connections as long as the internet's available to send and receive, so it's not tying up HF. But if the internet goes down, it will automatically shift to an HF mode, uh, either PACT or VARA, and start uh, sending and polling for incoming messages using HF. And then if the internet comes back up, it'll switch back to Telnet automatically. So it's all very flexible built in. And uh, this works well in conjunction with that SMTP pop IMAP option so that messages can be sent and received. They go through Telnet if it's available and then switch automatically uh, transparently to the end user to HF if the internet goes down. Now, shifting gears, once again, talk a little bit about mesh post office servers. Uh, you know, mesh 
in this case is the traditional or the common mesh we're talking about over using Wi-Fi uh, to link uh, nodes. Uh, and uh, we, RMS really can be configured to be a post office server operating on a mesh network. If you have multiple post office servers, it can automatically synchronize messages between them. So if a client's connected to one post office server and sends a message in, uh, that message will be uh, with literally within a seconds, be synchronized with all the other post office servers that are connect configured in. Uh, we have uh, quite an extensive use of mesh in uh, the Nashville area, but the, the not only do we do that, but uh, using what's what they call a tunneling, a tunneled mesh connection, which is goes through the internet, our mesh net in Nashville is tunneled into mesh networks in a number of other cities, and we have post multiple post office servers here in Nashville. The other uh, networks in other cities have multiple Winlink post office servers there, and we have them all synchronizing. So if anyone in, let's say, Nashville sends a message into a post office server here, uh, in just a short time, that's synchronized to all the other post office servers in Nashville and through the mesh, uh, through the tunnel, is also synchronized with all the network server or post office servers in other cities around the country. And I think one of them may be up in Alaska as well, we're tunneled to. This is uh, the screen in RMS Relay to set up the synchronization feature. What you do is you add an entry for each post office servers you want to you want to sync with, and then they start talking back and forth. And when a message comes in to any one of them, uh, they all start shaking hands and sending it back and forth and uh, uh, get it all around so everybody else gets updated very quickly. A WinLink client user using WinLink Express can send a message to another user and have that message stored on a post office server. The way you do it is there is a screen in WinLink Express uh, that has to do with doing a Telnet session to a network post office server. And in that screen, you configure which post office servers you want to use uh, to reach other people and configure uh, their call sign and, and the IP address of that server and the port number and so forth. So once you set up entries for all the post office servers you want to use, then you can start sending messages very easily to those post office servers and the other users connect to their post office server to receive the messages you've sent them. Having configured various post office servers, you can configure contacts and the contact specifies not only the call sign of the user, but also specifies the post office server where that user is going to be receiving their messages. Here I set up a, a, a contact with the name ICC, that's just the identifier I'm gonna use. Uh, the message is gonna go to the user W4PHS uh, there's a note about this uh, this entry, and then at the in the lower part, I select which post office server I want to use, and these are ones that have already configured in the system. So when I send a message and address it to the name ICC, that message is going to go to W4PHS, but it's going to go into the mailbox for W4PHS on the K1KY mail server, post office server. So now that I've got this contact set up for ICC, I can send a message, and up here I say to ICC, that's all I do, is specify the contact name. But from that contact name, it knows that it's going to the mailbox for W4PHS on the K1KY post office server. If you look at the outbox here, you'll notice over here in recipient field, it says W4PHS, and it says parenthesis PO. So it says it's going to W4PHS, but it's going to it on a post office server. It's not going to go to a conventional. It's only going to go to a post office server. Oh, I need to go. I need to hold on. Let's see. Drop back one screen here. I forgot one thing to mention. And that is notice back here when I was configuring the post office server, there's an option down at the bottom here, polling time and also send messages. And it says automatic background monitoring. When I queue up a message, for someone on this server, 
if I've got this time set as a background task, it will automatically notice that message is in the outbox and send it without having to explicitly start a se session. So once I've set this up and I have turned on the background task to reach this post office server, whenever I send the message, as soon as it goes in the outbox, if I've got a link uh, open, an internet link or a mesh link to that post office server, then literally within seconds, the message will be pulled out of the outbox and sent up to the post office server. So I don't have to explicitly open a session, send it. I just queue it to the outbox and boom, the background task picks it up and send it to the post office server and also pulls down any incoming messages from me from the post office server to my client station. Uh, now, this, I'm, this screen, I'm, I'm not going to go into the details of this. I would call this graduate level win link but it actually does work. And I, I set this up and we use it as an, at an incident, but using post office servers and background tasks and contacts, it's possible to have radios who are operating the radios forward messages using contact names to go into a post office server and then having other people who are not using radios, but using Winlink Express uh, with background tasks, pulling them out of the mailbox automatically get the messages into their system, compose replies, send the replies, which go back to the radios to be sent out by radio. So it allows the radios to focus on running the radios and the people who have to deal with the messages, the administrators, to focus on the messages without ever touching a radio. And also you can have uh, group addresses which uh, send copies of messages over the logger to, to keep logging it. So it's, as I said, this is a fairly complex system, but in a big incident, you can set this up and it's beautiful because radio operators only operate radios and the administrators, uh, the um, incident communication commu communi coordinator can deal with the messages and dealing and handling the messages without having to, to operate the radios also. Uh, in addition to doing the background tasks to go to post office server, there's a feature built into Express where you can do background connections to uh, Telnet to go to a CMS and you configure it so automatically any message you put in an outbox gets pulled up and sent to a CMS and it will pull for a message on the CMS and bring them back down to you. When you get all of these background tasks running, <laughs> uh, it can get confusing. So we've got a screen built into Winlink Express that'll show all of the background tasks that are running because you may have a background task to go to uh, by a telnet to a CMS. If you have multiple uh, post office servers you're, you're monitoring, you can have several tasks, background tasks to them. So this screen will show all of the ac active background tasks that are running uh, and, you know, sometimes messages may disappear from the outbox. They, where did they go? Well, they went to a post office server or through a CMS, through a background task, and that's why they suddenly disappeared. So we can show you which background tasks are running at any given time. The future. Well, what is the future for Winlink? Well, we hope it has a long future. <clears throat> Certainly, we're seeing a tremendous growth in civil agency support. Shares is growing like gangbusters, but it's not just shares. Oxcom community and the EMA community in general is growing very strongly. We've had a lot of RMSs uh, installed south of the U.S. border down in Mexico and uh, Central and South America. They have uh, quite a few of them have popped up. They're using it heavily. We continue to, uh, to create forms. We've got about 90 forms now and more requests are coming in regularly. Uh, we're always looking for feature requests and feedback from incidents and exercises. We are slowly phasing out the original sound card protocol, Winmore, and uh, shifting to newer ones, RDOP and, and VARA HF. Uh, VARA FM, which was uh, discussed quite a bit in the, in the previous session, is very popular and growing also very fast. We, I think we have five VARA FM RMSs in the Nashville area. It's much faster than packet. Uh, we're considering having some, uh, either some programs or some components of our system become open source. Uh, we are, Rick uh, Muthing is working on a, a, a HF, VHF uh, propagation simulator, which is extremely useful for testing protocols because you have a, a controllable environment where you can adjust the, 
uh, the noise floor and the noise level and then have repeated tests to see the speed and robustness of different condition, conditions. Uh, we're experimenting with and doing research on improved methods of doing automatic business busy detection. We want to be a good citizen. We don't want to step on other people's uh, QSOs that are going on. Of course, ultimately, we would like everybody to listen before they transmit. But uh, we also would like to prompt them and say, hey, you know, something we think something's going on here. You better listen before you transmit. So we're trying to make better automated uh, busy detector that we can build into the software. We're also continuing to add features to the WinLink to try to keep US hams legal. I mean, ultimately, the control operator is responsible for what they do. Uh, on the other hand, we can help them. Uh, we have a lot of checks built in. If a, a WinLink Express user uh, starts, tries to call a foreign RMS and that foreign RMS is operating on a frequency that's not legal for US hams, we will pop up a, a screen telling them, uh, that, hey, better watch out there. You're about to violate FCC rules. Operating on a frequency is not legal here. Uh, if a sysop tries to set up a channel that's on an illegal frequency, we'll tell him about that. Or if he sets up a, uh, tries to set up a frequency on a, a you know, like a PSK31 uh, watering hole, we'll warn him about that. So we do our best to assist people who want to be responsible and try to help them stay responsible. We also do uh, checking for profanity and messages. And we do, and we enforce third party uh, message rules for people sending messages out of the country. So we're doing our best to help people stay legal. So that is, that's it. I don't know, we have much time here, but I'll be happy to go over into the breakout room if we um, need to have more time for questions and answers. So, Phil, I don't have any questions coming in at the moment. Um, and if you are willing to uh, hang out, that was. Uh, if you're willing to hang out in the breakout room, that would be fantastic. We could do it here if anybody has any questions. It takes us a little bit to suck them over. There's a little bit of a time delay. But I don't know, Laura, if Laura or Steve are on, they might want to make some comments. There you go. Well, I just want to, I want to thank Phil for all the work he does, uh, Yeoman's uh, work on most of the major programs that uh, that users put their hands on. Uh, this presentation was about. Uh, I'm not sure what that means. Oops, well, uh, I'm sorry. The, the client programs, the RMS Relay, and the uh, and the Gateway programs are under Phil's watch and care. Um, the very back end systems are are dealt with by other people, but uh, Phil does. Uh, uh, incredible work and we want, we want to make sure he's recognized for all of that. Um, the, um, um, the, 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 the coverage today of all of this information is um, beyond what the normal WinLink user uses and what he does. This is really uh, uh, to describe the kind of uh, things that uh, and capabilities that WinLink has that uh, we've put into it that have been requested by um, the emergency communications and emergency management uh, community. Um, and um, for the casual ham who's interested in being able to send an email out to uh, uh, someone when perhaps uh, they don't have their own local internet it's easy just to download a simple program and get up and operating within 10 minutes or so and have that capability. Uh, so it can be simple and it can be as complex as it uh, appears with, through this uh, presentation today. Laura, let me, uh, this is Phil, let me add one other thing before we run out of time here. And that is we're always looking for uh, new uh, members of the Winlink team. We're certainly programmers, but, uh, but beyond programmers, we've been doing more hardware development recently than we had before. So people who are involved in microprocessor design or board layout or fabrication or helping us with fabrication, board layout design, uh, certainly a, a digital signal processing DSP, we're very interested in that. 
uh, any anything in that area having to do with digital communication is of interest to us, mesh networks. So if anybody's listening who is, is interested in the Winlink project and, and uh, would like to con- talk to us about contributing either uh, programming wise or board layout or whatever it may be, uh, we're, we're certainly interested in talking to them. Uh, I'd like to make a, one comment here uh, and give uh, some kudos to Phil Sherrod, who not only uh, uh, designed and uh, programmed and uh, implemented the radio only system, uh, but uh, has taken over most of the uh, programming for programs and has just done a remarkable job with uh, features um, that once you start using this, make a heck of a difference. Uh, the 309 generation, uh, for those that are really serious and in incidents where uh, that's not an easy task to do, uh, is one good example. Um, I wanted to say one other thing, the radio only system, although it's available on the amateur radio side, uh, you saw the shares network with over 90 RMS nodes in uh, the United States alone. Um, it takes a really good controlled environment for that system to uh, really be successful uh, as opposed to uh, um, a random RMS here and a random RMS there uh, on the amateur band. Uh, It also takes uh, more than harmonically related frequencies with our propagation that we have today. We're all victims of whatever propagation uh, conditions that are available uh, as Phil has said, but uh, there is a distinction there and there is a t- tremendous difference in the way the radio only portion functions. Um, normal wind link, the bridge over radio to the internet SMTP mail system is by far superior for amateur radio. So okay. I do have a couple of questions here now, if you, if you guys want to take them. Sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, of course, one of them here is uh, if someone wanted to donate to the Amateur Radio Safety Foundation, how would they do that? <laughs> you definitely want to answer that question, right? Well, the, the, the most practical way is to uh, download Winlink Express software and begin to use it. If you like it, you can register the program and that costs uh, $24 and you get a registration key that uh, uh, does only one thing in the program and that stops a a little nag pop up from uh, reminding you every several days that uh, we could use your registration. Um, Also, if uh, somebody uh, wanted to uh, donate the charitable remainder unit trust proceeds of their estate, uh, (laughs) we have out, we have a a process for that also. (laughs) So they should, uh, they should contact you directly there, uh, Steve or Laura. Yes. Yes. I'm a former, former, uh, former director of development for Vanderbilt University. And I, I know all the tricks to help these people. Tax all the ways to help collect some funds, right? He, yeah, he knows how endowments are built. <laughs> exactly. All right. Um, uh, let's see. So there's a couple questions here about, it says, legal or not, is it possible to send messages on ham frequency where the contents are obscured and not able to be decoded without sanction from Winley? That's no. something I think we chatted earlier. I mean, um, if, if somebody no, had, go ahead, Steve. If somebody had uh, AES or an, uh, encryption um, uh, tied into their end-user programming and put it over Winlink uh, on the amateur bands, uh, yeah, just like they could have take a, a voice, an obscure voice, but we we don't allow any uh, encryption or scrambling or obscuring of any data whatsoever on amateur radio. In fact, um, uh, every message is, uh, and Laura can talk more about this, is every message is listed in the system for anybody to see. It's a public domain, public service uh, uh, spectrum, as opposed to uh, some of the not, the, the reason why we have government, uh, we're on government uh, spectrum is because uh, we don't do that on the hand bands. Go ahead, Laura. There, sure, there's um, there are a number of things built into the system. Um, uh, Phil mentioned that we used it to 
help our users stay legal. Um, uh, however, one of the things it's uh, one of the filters that we have built in is a uh, an encrypted content uh, filter. If a message gets, somebody uses PGP, for example, uh, encodes their message and then tries to send it via one way, he can't get it into the system. It's bounced right back to him uh, with a service message saying uh, encrypted message are not allowed. Same thing if they swear or have content that is uh, uh, involved with, uh, uh, you know, Pecuniary, pecuniary interests or something like that. We catch a certain about, amount of them automatically. And then we also have the AWRL Volunteer Monitor Program plugged into a, a, a database that can be read directly off of the uh, Winwin website to see the content of every single message sent by every single US amateur radio station. So um, content is um, not private, not encrypted, and is completely available and open for anybody to see. Um, it is possible, like Steve says, for anybody to encrypt the message and send it uh, using some of the protocols that we offer, and frankly, parts and pieces of some of our software, but it won't get through the WinLink system. Uh, so just like guns are dangerous, uh, it takes people to make them dangerous. <clears throat> Uh, let's see, what do we also have? Uh, oh, uh, one issue that we have with uh, Washington Forms, it says, it's, is it possible to edit the message to forward? So the scenario is uh, local city EOC sends it to a county EOC and then on to the state EOC. Is it possible to modify that form? We, the... we have a feature built in uh, that I didn't mention, but when you, it's possible when you compose a message in Winley Express, to set a, an option which says this message may not be edited. And if that option is turned on, a special tag is put in the message. And when it goes, when it's received by someone, if uh, they, they can view it, but they cannot alter it. If they forward it on, it's going to be sent as they received it. They cannot edit it before forwarding on. So that, that, but, but that has to be, that tag has to be attached to the message when it's, when it's composed by the originator of the message. Uh, or you could send, can't you just send a multiple, uh, uh, a multiple uh, recipient message? So well, they, uh, they both places simultaneously. Yeah, we had a request from a hospital group, I think in California that uh, required messages to be non-editable. Uh, and uh, we added that feature for them. They're very happy with it now. They send, they use that in all of their messages. You can set it as default if you wish, uh, so that it's just basically this message must be delivered exactly as it's sent. So the default is that feature is turned off, correct? That is correct. You have to turn okay. it on. Uh, here's one that says, this may be a silly question, but how can I make the font larger in WinLink or is it tied to screen resolution? Uh, it's, it, we can't, we, we can't, that's a good, that's a good suggestion. You're not the first person to bring that up. Uh, current, the answer is currently there's no way to change the font or the, the screen resolution. It, it's fixed, uh, but certainly I understand that issue, that issue. And, uh, that's a very good, uh, potential improvement for the system. We're getting older eyes, right? Yeah. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Uh, has the team considered creating a visualization tool to show how the radio only network is currently behaving? Perhaps also showing a ping message traversing the system in real time? Well, yeah. I don't have vision, don't have like a, uh, uh, a nice, pretty visual tool. You can certainly do a ping message. And then when you get the result back, you can see the path to and from the station being pinged. Uh, but we don't have a map which would show the path. What about your analyzer? And that's not for ping. That's, uh, that's something else. Um, one thing, one thing you can see uh, on the propagation map uh, on the website is uh, over. You can select various time frames and look at uh, and filter band by band to see uh, uh, connections that are made uh, between users and. And RMS stations, yeah, but that doesn't specifically deal with uh, with radio only transit. Um, again, you know, radio only is is um, uh, 
especially in the amateur radio world, is an interesting technology, but there's no need for it. <laughs> there really is no need for it. It's driven by a requirement by the federal government and other governments for doomsday. And uh, it's an interesting experiment, and every radio-only message that gets sent is really only a forced message that's a test of the system. One of the reasons um, why I don't like radio <clears throat> only is because uh, it for amateur radio is because if it's not necessary, don't mess with the frequencies. Leave them alone. Leave them for other people. If it is necessary, then use it. But if it isn't, uh, taking a single uh, end user bridge to and from uh, the SMTP mail system is adequate communication. Yeah, you have to use radio, and our, our frequencies are precious. Use radio for where it needs to be used. Use the internet, if it exists, where it can be used. And then combine the both to get the power of everything together. Uh, so uh, somebody else is asking, what happened with the FCC and WinLink last year? I think we saw a bunch of stuff Nothing. flying around, and it's not clear that... Uh, there was any kind of, it's, it seems like you guys have made some changes, right? Like the ability to view messages and things like that since then? Well, the FCC has uh, currently a number of, uh, are, are sitting on top of a number of uh, uh, petitions that have been uh, submitted to it by the ARRL, also by another group who would like to see uh, uh, some changes made to um, uh, What's the best way to put it? There's a handful of people who believe that the protocols that we use cannot be read off the air, and therefore they are, quote, encrypted telecommunications. And their interpretation of the FCC rules is that is that, that is illegal. Um, we're waiting for the FCC to, uh, to take action on that, and um, uh, we're working with them. We've made all the comments and they're all publicly available for everybody to see uh, the arguments are interesting to read um, but it will take uh, action by the fcc to actually make some decisions um, where we don't have a lot of good feedback they do things in their own good time um, there's been a uh, proposal by the arrl to uh, remove the current 300 baud uh, Symbol rate. Symbol, symbol rate limit that uh, holds back the use of certain protocols like Pacto 4, for example. Um, and, it, and it holds back the development of a lot of new modes that could perform even better. Um, so uh, outside of the United States, there are there's mode development going on. Uh, Pacto 5 is uh, not too far away. Um, and these are all modes that will never be possible for amateur radio operators to use in the United States because of the antiquated law. Uh, so nothing was decided at this point? There were no comments, no feedback from the FCC so far? Nothing from the FCC at all so far, not on any of these subjects. Um, we've, we've made our case and we're standing back waiting for some answers and uh, the other, um, our opponents are are continuing to lobby the FCC to try to get their way, and we're uh, we're answering whatever questions come up. So that's the status. And uh, somebody else is asking, what about a port to Linux for some of the RMS software? It looks like some progress might have been made. Oh, a lot. Um, there have we've been working with a uh, cadre of uh, third-party authors. Uh, you had John Weisman on earlier t today. John is. Uh, uh, works very closely with us, and um, his BPQ32 program, uh, BPQ32 and Lin um, BPQ, both are uh, RMS programs that can can run on uh, Linux machines, even uh, little R Raspberry Pis. There are a number of uh, people uh, who are integrators that are putting together uh, hardware and software, Linux software out there to uh, produce uh, low cost uh, RMS stations, mainly for packet, but also can be used for HF. Um, so it's possible now to carry around a literally a, a pocket RMS station 
powered by a very low cost battery and and uh, and connected up to a uh, to a very uh, lightweight radio at the same time, and you can have a, a station, literally an RMS station, in your pocket. Uh, what we are what we are doing um, uh, is looking at a number of our programs to release to um, uh, to open source, and um, we see a lot of benefits to the amateur community, so that a lot of our ideas can be picked up and uh, and uh, multiplied out by other by other uh, developers, and at the same time, we hope to attract a number of of uh, younger um, and uh, young, younger programmers and younger developers who uh, who have uh, a different mindset than where we came from as a group. Uh, there are new places to go with amateur radio, and we think that's important to try to cultivate so, all those changes. Excellent. It looks like there's one last question, and that is, uh, how do we know every message sent is visible on the website? I guess you don't, um, unless uh, you, if you choose not to believe us. But uh, if if the uh, if there's doubt involved, we're completely open to um, to IT uh, audits and review and so forth. And if anybody uh, wants to come in and and uh, uh, certainly look over the databases and then compare the, what's what's in the uh, web viewer to see that uh, it's all there, uh, they certainly can. I, I'd like, uh, it's also a matter of we're the only one doing this and uh, we're the only one doing this, in other words, in the United States. If somebody from China sends a message to somebody in Russia, no, it's not on there for the public to see in the United States. We're looking at the only restrictive uh, requirements that we face and that's with the Federal Communications Commission and that's where... Uh, we yeah, hold, the viewer. Yeah, like we hold a responsibility. Yeah, the viewer on the website. That uh, first of all, any um, RMS operator has to be able to see the traffic that's going through his gateway, no matter where they are in the world. They have that ability. Um, however, any amateur radio operator, whether they're a WinLink user or not, has the ability to look at all traffic that goes through all. U.S. stations, and that's driven mainly by at the request of the FCC and the uh, AWRL Volunteer Monitor Program, and uh, uh, and uh, ideal and honestly, it was it was also something that we put into place to try to squelch some of our uh, opponents that say there's all kinds of bad stuff happening. It uh, it also, uh, in my opinion, it squelches a lot of development by other people. Who may want to emulate what we're doing as as we move further into more enabling technologies in the digital arena it's really a uh, you know you're stepping on your tongue a lot when that when, when you can't uh, do this and you can't do that and but you can text <laughs> no third party traffic to england but you can text uh, so the rules uh, really need to be sieved uh, if and when the FCC has the time and the inclination to do so. Excellent. That is all I have. Um, if you guys are willing to hang out for just a few minutes in the breakout room and see if anybody's interested in asking any more questions, that would be fantastic. Okay, we'll do that. Thank you. Yeah, we can do that. All right. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Scott. Wonderful forum, and um, and uh, we appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'm sorry for the issues that we had earlier, but uh, really appreciate that you guys were able to hang in there and and, uh, and and provide this information. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Ta -ta. Thank you very. Good night, gentlemen.